In this video, we come to the heart of the third century crisis that begins with the overthrow of the Sephardim dynasty. Uh, and now we enter 50 years that were some of the darkest and most desperate in Roman history. Uh, the Senate, by this point, had been reduced to irrelevance, and so the authenticity of the emperor, their legitimacy, was based solely on the support of the army. And so when the Severan dynasty ends, we have different armies led by the commanders who all want to be emperor marching on Rome. And the army had also discovered that in days when their typical wages from silver coins wouldn't buy them anything because of rampant inflation, by staging a coup, removing an emperor and installing another one, they would receive a bonus in gold coins that were actually worth something. And so this means that we're going to see uh, consistent coups that are occurring throughout this period, basically on average every two years. At the same time uh, that Rome was weak internally, Rome is also facing new and more powerful external enemies. And so we start to find the Germanic tribes to the north of Rome who had always resisted conquest are coalescing into larger and more dangerous groups. This is partly as a result of interaction with the Romans. The Romans would go across the river, they would be trying to make peace with the Germanic tribes, they would ask who their king was. Germanic tribes kind of said, well, we live by ourselves in the forest, in the small family community, and the Romans would say, well, there must be someone who you listen to, who's your authority figure. Well, maybe the guy down the road, he has a slightly larger family. And so the Romans would go to that guy, would do peace treaties with him, uh, trading deals with uh, that tribe that had implications for other tribes along the frontier. And so gradually you see these tribes uh, coalescing. Meanwhile, to, uh, and they're coalescing into larger and more powerful and more dangerous groups for the Romans. At the same time, in the east, the Parthians, who had long been opponents of the Romans who had resisted conquest, were overthrown by a new group called the Sassanids, who created the new Persian Empire. The Sassanids lay claim to be the true successors of Darius the Great, Cyrus the Great, and the ancient Persian Empire, and they start trying to reconquer those lands. And so this is going to lead to a state of almost constant war uh, with the Romans. In the year 243, the Persians invaded and the current emperor named Gordian, who was about 18 years old at the time, was killed in battle, making the first Roman emperor ever killed in battle. Uh, the coups uh, continued, and over the next 50 years until 284, there were 50 emperors, some of which were only recognized by the army, some of which were only uh, reigning for a matter of days. Move on uh, to the next slide now. The empress had tried to provide stability for the empire by following the practice of the period of the Pax Romana. They nominated their sons as their heirs. And so the idea is we already have someone in place. He's obviously going to be the new emperor. However, it was obvious that these uh, children and heirs were figureheads, uh, that they hadn't earned the support of the army that was necessary for them to establish their legitimacy. So Rome is not just... Um, a biological monarchy at this point. And the army demands some kind of say in the process, and this is going to lead to uh, this sort of instability. Um, so now uh, we have invaders that are pouring in from all sides of the empire. The Alemanni uh, barbarian group in Italy uh, were defeated there, but could not be driven back across uh, the Rhine and the Danube. And so the Romans uh, decided they were better forming up their own defenses, and they formed a breakaway empire of Gaul, Spain, and Britain in the West. And by doing this, they restored the uh, uh, stability of the empire's frontier, but the unity of the empire had been shattered. Uh, and so now you've got to the point where the different parts of the empire are choosing to go their separate ways uh, rather than fight for the empire. And so in the past, the Roman Empire, being part of the Roman Empire, meant that uh, you were more stable and more protected. And now that's starting no longer to be the case. That now being part of the Roman Empire means that you're actually more vulnerable uh, to, um, to attacks and to instability. And it's better to form uh, your own empire. After the Emperor Gallienus, who had certainly done his best to fight off these invasions, but was kind of fighting a losing battle. After he dies in 268, 
succeeded by a succession of uh, soldier emperors from the province of Illyria, which is modern day Croatia. So kind of the point, point where the western and the eastern part of the empire, empire meets. Um, and these uh, emperor, emperors were not the aristocrats from Rome anymore. Uh, they were soldiers from the army. They perhaps had a better connection to their troops. And so uh, you start to see greater competence. You start to see a little less instability. The most famous of these emperors uh, was uh, a man named Aurelian, uh, who was successful in driving out the rest of the barbarians who had invaded, uh, who, but who then took action to defend Rome. He withdrew from some of the province of Dacia around the Black Sea, and he built the Aurelian Wall around Rome. This is the first fortification built around the city of Rome for over 500 years. And so it tells you that Aurelian recognized that even though he had uh, defeated the most recent uh, barbarian invasion, uh, he recognized that Rome was weak and that Rome was vulnerable to invasion. And this is something that 100 years before uh, would have been laughed at, the idea that Rome could be captured and attacked by these barbarian groups. When we hear about all this chaos, uh, because even Aurelian in the end is assassinated, uh, we wonder why the Roman Empire hasn't fallen yet, why it's still holding together. This, again, is part of the great strength of the Roman Empire, that even in desperate situations, uh, the government continued to function, taxes were still collected, the army was still paid, major cities were wealthy enough to build their own fortifications, and even life on the frontier could be relatively peaceful. Now, it's more fluid than some modern borders, um, and sometimes it was hard to know who was on which side of the border. Uh, but um, in general, life was fairly peaceful. The Romans and the barbarians adopted one another's cultures and continued to live in some sort of harmony, along with the outbreak, these outbreaks of violence that we've been talking about. This ability of the Roman Empire to fight on and not to give up made the revival of the empire in the late third century possible. And this revival was led by an emperor named Diocletian, who became emperor in 284. And so here we're going to see another transition of Roman power from, we saw from Republic to Principate in the time of Augustus. And that transition happened because the structures of the Roman Republic were no longer able to govern the Roman Empire. And the same thing is going to happen now. We're going to see a transition from a Principate to an empire because the structures of the Principate, uh, the government structure that we've been following for the last couple of weeks, is no longer able to provide the kind of stability and security that the Roman Empire requires. Diocletian was also a soldier. He was also from this province of Illyrium. His father had been a slave and a steward, uh, which meant that Diocletian understood uh, balancing a budget and keeping the books. It shows that even in this later part of the history of Rome, there were still opportunities for those within the Roman Empire uh, to rise to the top. Diocletian rises to become emperor through a career in the military and then through uh, killing those and killing and defeating those in his way and gaining the support of the army. And at this point in the third century crisis, these are really the only two qualifications. After he becomes emperor, however, Diocletian reveals that he has an organizational and a political genius that enables him to restore the empire. First of all, he removes the last vestiges of authority from the Senate, which becomes just the city council of Rome. Uh, and so the Senate had already been in decline. Uh, and so now this is just kind of acknowledging the reality. The Senate no longer uh, is an effective partner for the emperor. Diocletian is also going to change the role and image of the emperor. No longer, as in the time of Augustus, is the emperor going to be just another citizen, but the most virtuous citizen who can maintain the structures of the, of the republic. Instead, Diocletian is going to present the emperor as master, lord, and almost godlike. And so he wears a purple robe, he wears a crown, and everything about his person becomes sacred. And this is totally different from the previous emperors who wore a uh, military uniform, emphasized that they're sort of just the greatest soldiers of the Republic. 
And now, if you wanted to see the emperor, because the emperor was being treated more like a god, you couldn't just walk up to him. You had to walk through the corridors of long rooms. The emperor would be surrounded by his court. You might not even get to meet him face by face, face to face. Sacrifices had to be offered to the emperor all over the empire. And so this change <coughs> in the cult of the emperor supports greater stability in the empire. It's much more difficult to assassinate the emperor now, and uh, just in practical terms, and also in uh, terms of cultural expectations. So if you're assassinating the emperor, you're not just killing another general so you can replace him with a different general. Instead, you're attacking God. Now, Diocletian is a smart guy. Did he think that he was a god? No. But Diocletian thought that the stability of Roman government was the most important thing in the world in which he lived. And so these sacrifices that he's ordering people to offer to the emperor throughout the empire are not so much to say the emperor is a god, at least in Diocletian's mind, although he doesn't mind if people think that. They're also to say, you are offering sacrifices to the emperor to show that you value and support the stability of Rome and the progression of Rome through the rule of law and that we're moving away from this period of coups. This, however, creates a very difficult situation with the growing Christian population in the empire. The Christians, many Christians strongly felt that offering sacrifices to the emperor, even if they understood that it was more of a, a social duty rather than a religious act, uh, was a betrayal of God, was suggesting that there was another God beyond the God of the Christians. And so we start to see Christians refuse uh, to sacrifice to Diocletian. And this leads to the only uh, Roman effort to totally suppress Christianity throughout the empire. And this begins in 303. And so Christian books are burned, Christian churches are destroyed, Christian clergy are arrested, and Christians are forced to choose between sacrifice and death. And so in the eyes of Diocletian, you're in this crisis situation. You have the small part of the population that refuses to go along with this ritual that you think is perhaps in the end meaningless, um, but is necessary for establishing stability in the empire. And uh, for the Christians, you have an emperor who's trying to force them to deny that there is only one God um, and only one God who should receive worship. And so many Christians, choose to become martyrs, choose to die rather than, in their eyes, abandon their faith. And their example actually exa encourages more sympathy for the Christians. So the Christian population is large enough by this point that uh, Diocletian is not really going to be able to wipe them all out. And this campaign of terror that he adopted actually has the reverse uh, effect, where more people start actually becoming Christian. 